it's wonderful to see you all here on this very warm evening. On behalf of the Schwab Center for Israel and Jewish Studies at the University of Nebraska Omaha and the Jewish Federation of Omaha, I am really pleased to welcome you to the culminating event of our summer author series with Alana Massad. We have been very pleased to have Alana with us for the last two weeks giving an author talk, which you can view online if you haven't had a chance to see it yet. And over the past week, Ms. Massad has been conducting an Emerging Writers Workshop, um, of which we will hear some of the participants reading their works tonight. Um, in addition to the sponsorships, I want to mention the very important co-sponsors from the University of Nebraska Omaha, the UNO English Department, the UNO Women's and Gender Studies, and the UNO's Writers Workshop. And I'm very pleased that tonight we have with us the department chair from UNO English Department to make a few words. Um, in support of the project. Uh, Dr. Bridgeford, would you like yeah. to chime in? I sure would. Thanks, Jeanette. Uh, I just wanted to say that the English department is excited to be a part of this event. Uh, I'm happy to be here and uh, representing the department and I'm looking forward to hearing writers read their work. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Bridgeford. We're so excited about this collaboration and hope it will be an enduring model for future events. And without then further ado, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jenny Gates Beckman, the Director of Community Engagement over at the Jewish Federation of Omaha. I'm Jenny Gates Beckman. I'm so pleased that all of you have, uh, some, some of you have returned, some of you are just joining us tonight. Um, We've been so thankful to have uh, the author, Alana Massad, with us. And um, if you did not attend the talk, once I get back on the call, I will pop the link in the chat so folks can um, take a look at that. Um, she has been a PhD student at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln um, and has been living in Lincoln and um, so so close from us and her first novel all my mother's lovers just came out um i really invite you to to go and check out the link and see her talk i'm not gonna i'm not gonna expand more on that i will let her introduce this this course and her emerging writers group um and we're just again so pleased to have you here so i'm going to turn it over to alana and she's going to give some um ground rules and, and help us understand what it means to be a supportive audience member. So, Alana, do you wanna take it away? Thank you, Jenny, and thank you, Jeanette, and thank you, Dr. Bridgeford. Um, so, first of all, I'm so pleased to see you all here tonight, um, and I'm so excited to hear uh, my lovely, amazing students and collaborators of the last, uh, of last week uh, read their work tonight. Um, so just a few notes before we get started. Um, if you want to show appreciation while an author is reading, um, there are a couple of ways that you can do this. So one way is to use your little uh, chat in the in the bottom of the Zoom screen. You'll have reactions, um, and you can you know do the little clapping hand motion. You can do a heart. You can do a little celebratory uh, sort of exactly or a thumbs up like Lynn is doing right now. Um, and another way uh, that uh, I have found during this past year and a half of kind of doing more Zoom events, um, this often happens at poetry readings, but it works perfectly well for flash fiction as well, is that uh, if you want to support or if you really like um, uh, a line that an, a, one of the writers has read, uh, typing that line in the chat is sort of a way to be like, oh, I really like the sound of that or "Ooh, that was that moved me. So uh, if you feel moved to do that, feel free. Um, and at the end, we'll all unmute just for a little bit to sort of so that the writers can hear our clapping sounds, because this is not quite the same as being in an actual room with people, but we're going to do our best to make it feel as similar to that as possible. So uh, the first writer tonight is Nikita Haney. Is that okay, Nikita? Okay. All right. A tenacious Georgia peach currently thriving among the sunflowers in Lawrence, Kansas, Nikita Haney is an educator, Black creative, dreamer, and writer. As a Black woman writer, she understands the power in amplifying her voice. 
By day, she works with college students while building her writing career. In 2018, Nikita published the first installment in her college book series, Phases. Currently, she is an assistant editor for The Pedestal Project, where she previously served as a contributing writer. Nikita is also the creator of Write On Black Girl, a movement dedicated to amplifying the voices of Black women who write. Her mission is to influence the world through storytelling centering on Black people, specifically Black women, and their experiences. The process of transforming from a girl staying up late at night and reading and writing to an author hasn't been easy. However, she is committed to leaving a legacy of writing, Black womanhood, and creativity in the world. Please welcome Nikita. Good evening. Wow, they're really like, you know, I was like, surely I'm not going to be the first person. Go figure. <laughs> but it's all good. Um, so we read a story called Spent, um, and Alana had us do an activity with that particular piece. And so this is kind of um, similar to that piece, but for me. Um, and it's called Evolve. Um, the time she was bullied by the most popular girl in school, the time she stood up for herself audaciously, the time she got rejected from her top choice for college, the time she got accepted to the rival school, the time she partied her freshman year away and failed, the time she transferred and made the dean's list, the time she put the needs of everyone else before hers, the time she realized people pleasing was a toxic trait. The time she took a leap of faith and moved across the US, the time she realized even when you're afraid, you should do it anyway. The time she chose herself even when it hurt others, the time she hated her body, the time she looked in the mirror and affirmed her body, the time she chose healing, the time she chose joy unapologetically, the time she chose herself, the time she chose herself again and again and again. That's it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Nikita. Thank you, thank you. Up next, we have Ariel O'Donnell. Ariel O'Donnell is a poet by practice who is looking to broaden her prose skills. She is interested in the tradition of blending poetic language into the production of prose. She is the wordsmith of two literary collections with a third releasing in summer 2021. She is currently finishing her BA intersecting religious studies, philosophy, and creative writing. When she is not writing, she can be found baking challah, spending time with her cats Kaczynski and Kafka, and drinking black coffee while watching the sunrise. Please welcome Ariel. God, I sound gross. Okay, um, <laughs> you know, I know. okay. Um, so this uh, piece is entitled Wait, uh, spelled W-E-I-G-H-T, to give you an idea of what we might be talking about. Um, and it was uh, spawned by a writing prompt that we did um, that began with, hello, my life. Um, but I added, um, I tried to add some of the other techniques that we learned and things of that nature. So here it is. <clears throat> it's called Wait. I find myself asleep these days. It is difficult to distinguish between sleeping and waking. It is easier to sleep away the sun and sit with the moon. She is gentle in the stillness. I sleep on a mattress on the floor, guarded by towers of boxes still packed from the last move. We have lived here for months now, and I cannot bring myself to open the boxes. I have stopped coming home until it is time for bed. This room is a graveyard to ghosts that are not mine. Brutes are difficult. Tending them costs so much of you. There is an old woman who has slept in a chair ever since her husband died. It's the only way I've ever known her to be. I visit as often as I can to kneel at the base of her throne. I come to worship. She is our matriarch. She has started to consume the chair. Her body expanding spills out of the frame. It is the way her mother left this world and her, her mother's mother before her. 
turned them, stretching their bodies until they can cave inward like a spent star. Every time she speaks of her mother, a lilac blooms from her throat. When she speaks of her childhood, it is a daisy. When she laughs, a tulip sprouts. When she goes quiet, it is a small rose. She coughs them out. We pick them one in a vase on the table. There is a garden in her living room. She says she has ventured out of her chair in the last week to bask in the sun outside. Of course, we say. She says the governor recently visited her. He sat on the couch next to her chair. She says she asked him to protect the Jewish people. Of course, we say. She says she is doing okay today. Of course, we say. On this particular visit, I approach her seat of honor, grasp her thick hand and whisper a delicate question. Do you want to be buried next to him? You don't have to be, you know. Slowly her eyes weigh down, cradled by her high cheekbones, like bright blue infants swaddled amongst cracked skin. She looks through me. It's all right, she mumbles. I'll be dead. I wonder how many times she has died already. I wonder when she realized she is shackled to him. I wonder when she accepted that fate. Enough of that now, we are worshiping. Enough of that now, we are tending to the garden. Enough of that now, we are here to bear witness, not question. Silence engulfs us, weighing heavily on the room. The old woman asks for a pastry. I retrieve one for her. Vibrant scarlet jelly dribbles from the punctured dough, sliding gently down her shaky hand. She struggles to lick it clean, like a wound, covered in sweet sugar, had been ripped open, its remnants consumed as quickly as they appeared, leaving no trace it was ever there. There are no scars if you swallow them all. I excuse myself and step outside for a cigarette. I end up having three. I yell at God without saying a word. I remind him I am still angry with him, that he has yet to regain my trust. I tell him that this is what men do, the wreckage they leave, the haunting weight. He remains silent. I am used to this now. Perhaps he feels called out. Perhaps he feels ashamed. Perhaps he is ignoring me. When it is time to leave, I embrace the old woman. She says, you should visit more often. I will, I promise. I pick the weight of my words carefully, always knowing they may be my last ones with her. She tells me to take a lilac home. I do. I find myself asleep these days. It is difficult to distinguish between sleeping and waking. It is easier to sleep away the sun and sit with the moon. She is gentle in the stillness. This room is littered with withering flowers. In the stillness, they are illuminated by the moonlight. There is a garden in my bedroom. There are ghosts here that are not mine. Roots are inevitable. Tending them costs all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariel. That was so beautiful. And Nikita, Nikita's work was so beautiful. I'm so moved to hear you reading. All right, our next reader is Karina Faz. Karina Faz is a writer and filmmaker from Dallas, Texas, who now resides in Brooklyn, New York. Karina received her bachelor's degree in radio television production from Texas A&M University Commerce. She is also a graduate of the Made in New York Production Assistant Training Program and is a member of Kappa Delta Chi Sorority. Currently, she's finishing her MFA at the University of Nebraska Omaha in fiction. Karina enjoys writing YA, magical realism, and TV and film screenplays. Her script, Tres Leches, was recently awarded Best Comedy Feature Screenplay at the LA Understars Film Festival. Her television pilot screenplay, The Right Type, was a finalist in the Houston Comedy Film Festival and the Oregon Short Film Festival. 
Her short film script, Intruder, won Best First Time Short Script Writer at Boobs and Blood International Film Festival. Please welcome Karina Faz. Hi. Um, I wrote this piece, it's really short, the last day of workshop. We were given a writing prompt where you take a recipe and you kind of change out words and move it around. And I honestly don't know how it turned into this because it's nothing like that, but here we are. It's called Green Over Brown. Green Over Brown, like an avocado. It's green flesh covering a brown pit. They are imported and welcomed by the millions into this country every year from south of the border. Like a tree providing shade with its thousand green leaves, rustling in the wind, distracting from its brown skin trunk. The reproduction encouraged and a migration of newly planted trees welcomed. Like green succulents covering brown dirt and fancy chic earthen pots, sold by the hundreds in special occasion flower boutiques, low maintenance and won't hound you for constant assistance of water, just the freedom of sunshine and an occasional drop of rain. Like two plates, one filled with green salsa and one filled with brown tortilla chips. Take a brown chip, dip, paint it green and enjoy. The more chips, the merrier, but don't forget to dip as it's only a party when they have green. A scale of a fish, of a mermaid, la sirena, to have been born with green scales over my brown skin. Thank you so much. All right, up next, we have Tanya Secord. Tanya Secord loves to read, write, and think about writing fiction. There is always a story in her head. She believes the best feeling is putting the story down on paper and allowing the characters to write themselves. Tanya is currently attending UNO for Gender and Women's Studies. She enjoys learning to play the violin and reading stories about strong, fierce women. She lives in Omaha with three cats and her husband. Please welcome Tanya. Hello. So this um, piece is from um, the progression of the surreal. And I'm going to try to make it come over to the screen. OK. I'm going to try not to be nervous. I'm really nervous. <laughs> it's called Holes. It's 2 o'clock, and I'm out of bread. I promised the kids grilled cheese for dinner, so I had better hurry before the rain starts at three. Two years ago, it began to ra rain at three on the dot every day. The rain lasts for about an hour and it's brutal. People and pets have died in various ways from this harsh rain, some indirectly as a result of terrible accidents. A couple of children were forced down by the heaviness and drowned, some from trees falling on houses, cars, pedestrians. One unlucky person thought he could outrun it and his motorbike and was actually cut in half by the speed of it all. If I don't hurry, I will get stuck in this store with some god awful strangers who wanna talk about the weather or any other uncomfortable thing. I hate small talk and so I rush. The trouble with rushing just before the rain is that everyone else is rushing as well. The stoplights seem to take forever and you have to be wary of other drivers since no one takes the light seriously. It's a red light, not a suggestion, I yell through, though they can't hear me. I finally run into an overcrowded store, cursing myself for not going earlier. I grab my measly items and stand in the theme park-like line to check myself out. Everyone is jittery. It's eerily quiet today with the feeling that something is going to happen. You can feel it in the air. You can hear it in the buzz of the overhead lights and the smell of ozone that blows through the sliding door every time some lucky stranger carrying his purchases, rushes from the store without looking back. I finally pay for my purchases with 15 minutes to spare and I rush out of the store to home. At 10 to three, I began to see raindrops on my windshield. Fuck, I cried, the, name, the rain never starts this early. I hear a sizzle and notice the streams coming from the hood of my car. The rain, now increasing in weight, begins burning holes in everything it touches. My adrenaline spikes as the rain begins to burn through my windshield in tiny, perfectly round holes 
my dash is smoking as well. I feel a drop and then a burn on my shoulder and I realize the rain is burning through the roof. Some of my hair is gone. The burning rain is affecting other drivers as well. I look up in, t in time to see a car get T-boned and the driver of the first car is thrown through the windshield onto the hood of his car. He's barely conscious, but I can hear the screams as I rush past, narrowly avoiding another car that shot through the stoplight. By now my skin is on fire and half my hair is gone. I grab my purse and newspaper, anything to cover myself. I need to make it home to my kids. Barely making it home, I'm shocked to see half of my roof is on fire. The front windows are smashed out and I hear terrified screams coming from within. I rush inside, grab the kids who are standing in the basement doorway screaming for me and rush them downstairs. There are no windows in the basement, so I hope and pray very loudly that the rain stops soon and leaves enough of the house intact to protect my family. I grab the first aid kit that we keep in the basement on a shelf by the steps next to the fire extinguisher, thankfully, and start checking my kids for burns. Only one of them has a bad burn on his face and arms, so I loosely bandage that up with the ointment. I keep wiping my face and sleeve until I realize it's blood running down my face and not rainwater. Now it's time, now that I'm certain the kids are okay, I take stock of myself. My clothes are ruined with holes in blood. My arms are bloody. My scalp burns so badly I almost black out. I'm not sure how I keep my shit together, but I need to for the children. Suddenly I realize it's quiet out. My ears pop as if coming out of a long tunnel. The rain has stopped. Telling the kids to stay put, I cautiously walk upstairs. I open the door at the top and am relieved beyond words that the horror has indeed stopped. I hear a noise and turn to see the kids behind me. We step out into the living room and are shocked by what we see. It's as if a bomb has dropped in the middle of our roof. Our once lovely house is decimated. We all stare at each other in shock until finally Amy says, Mom, you have holes in your head. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. Thank you. All right, our last reader of the evening, last but not least, is Lauren Ward. After attending her first Take Back the Night rally and march in college, Lauren Ward wrote an academic response paper to the event for her women's studies class. As her experience throughout life, she felt compelled to write more creatively about her experience at the rally, and a poem quickly fell from her fingertips. What followed inadvertently birthed her professional career. Lauren turned in that poem instead of the academic paper, spurring a project using the poem as a springboard for public speaking about violence. For the nearly 19 years since then, Lauren has served around issues of sexual and domestic violence and currently serves as the Assistant Vice President of Trafficking and Violence Prevention with the Nebraska Children and Families Foundation and adjunct faculty in Women's and Gender Studies at UNO. While Lauren has two book chapters published, her dream since childhood has been, has been to publish a book. She has long been writing a literary memoir, and while she hopes to complete and publish that, the boundlessness of fiction attracts, excites, and rightfully scares her. The dream is to write stories that matter and linger and to be able to create full time. Lauren, please take our stage. Thanks. That's what I get for taking my wife's last name with a W going last. Um, so uh, I also somehow wrote this on the last day um, when we were working on imposed restraints and we read a piece um, called Mad Lib, which took the format of a Mad Lib. And the, um, the prompt was the recipe prompt. And I thought at first, I'm going to sit here and either write nothing or work on something else. And then somehow this kind of came out. So uh, trigger warning, um, as there are issues of violence and other things. It's called the family recipe. Step one, put the adolescence in a microwavable bowl with a scald of shame, repeat, then repeat on high for five minutes until submissive or belittle or infantilize them. Step two, meanwhile, inflict the pattern in a frying pan over a suffocating heat. Add the secrets 
with a hush of sin and confess for 10 minutes, stirring so they don't run until submissive. Tip in the control, turn up the heat and pressurize for a couple of minutes to numb them up a bit. Cut through the skin. Step three, make four slices into the spirit in the pan. Crack a wound into each, salt. Then cover the mouth and silence for six to eight minutes until the voice has set and the spirit is broken. Serve the slut shaming on the side with the abuse in the middle of the table. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, if people would like to unmute now just to clap so that our readers can hear all of our clapping, you may. So th thank you again to our readers, to Nikita and Ariel, and to Karina and Tanya and Lauren. Thank you, thank you. It is so wonderful to hear your words. And thank you to Jeanette and to Dr. Bridgeford and to Jenny for putting this together and for bringing me here and bringing all of these writers together to, to make their work sing. Thank you. And for all of you for being here tonight. So I, I don't know if Jeanette has final words as well, but I just wanted to add that um, it was really lovely being able to engage this group and hopefully uh, in the future we'll be able to do something similar, but in a more uh, in person format so that we can uh, share the warmth of your uh, words in person. Yeah, I would just like to add um, how wonderful it was to hear your incredible work and I really appreciated your um, your thoughts about um, how the workshop sort of helped you generate different things that you wrote this week. It was really exciting. Um, and I, I just want to comment that, um, you know, we're so proud to have such a talented group um, convening together. And I am looking forward to reading so much more of your words and being able to follow all of your exciting careers that are in front of you um, and would urge all of you to stay in touch with us um, and consider that the um, the Schwab Center, UNO, and the Jewish Federation of Omaha is a, um, a partner for you as you go on in your career and uh, that we are seeking ways to highlight and feature your work um, going forward, just as we've had this wonderful opportunity to work with the incredible, talented Alana Massad. Um, it's really been such an honor um, to have her here with us this last week. Thank you again, and we will probably say good night, I believe. Oh my gosh, no, I need more. This is where we're supposed to walk around and drink and talk to each other. I don't want to- I know, I wish we could. I wish wonderful, we could. thank you. Thank you so much. This is great. <laughs> thank, thank you, Kale. We, we really look forward to a time very soon where we can all do that and where we can bring some of these wonderful writers to UNO and hold that type of event. Or a chat book, just so I can reread them and unpack them. Really good, everyone. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, and good night.